Before we come to Prime Minister's questions, I would like to point out that the British Sign Language Interpretation of Proceedings is available to watch on Parliament Live TV. We now come to questions to the Prime Minister, John McNamara. Question number one, please. Mr Speaker, today marks the 16th anniversary of the 7-7 London bombings. We remember the 52 innocent people who lost their lives and those who were injured and pay tribute to the city's emergency services for their heroic response. Mr Speaker, I'm sure the whole House will wish to join me in sending condolences to the family and friends of Sislin Faye Allen, who died earlier this week. She was the UK's first black female police officer, and she served in the Metropolitan Police. Mr Speaker, I'm sure colleagues will also want to join me in wishing the England football team the best of luck for tonight's semi-final against Denmark. This morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have such, further such meetings uh, later today. John uh, Martin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister, we hear a great deal in this place about the rule of law and injustice. Can the Prime Minister tell me what he is going to do about the injustice that my constituents in Falkirk, indeed families up and down the UK, are facing every day because of the retrospective loan charge that is fast turning into the next post office scandal? The hounding by HMRC, clearly out of control, accountable to no one, has managed to hoodwink, mislead his own Treasury ministers. And now, according to the head of HMRC, the retrospective loan charge appears to be without any legal basis or justification. Therefore, will the Prime Minister accept this matter needs further and immediate investigation? Mr Speaker, I am acutely aware, as I think all colleagues are around the House, of the, uh, the pain suffered by those who entered into loan charge schemes, and I think, I think uh, alas, that they were uh, misguided to, to do so, uh, but I think that the, uh, the, the line taken by the Treasury, I am afraid, is, is right on this. Let us go to John Stevenson. John. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister, there is more that unites us than divides us, is very true of the United Kingdom. However, improved connectivity is vital to ensuring we remain united. The government's recent interim connectivity review has suggested some improvements. If this is really going to happen, then improvements must be made to the A75, the A69 and to the extension of the Borders Railway. Does the Prime Minister support such investment and what is the timescale for such investment? Uh, I thank uh, my honourable friend for his excellent uh, question. I think he should uh, not have too long to wait for the uh, final recommendations from Sir Peter Hendy about uh, the A75 and other great uh, features of union uh, connectivity uh, which, th which this government uh, hopes to support. But we've already uh, agreed uh, five million uh, from the, uh, the UK and the Scottish governments uh, to support uh, the extension of the Edinburgh Tweed Bank Borders uh, Railway uh, to Carlisle. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in his, in his remarks about the 7-7 anniversary? Um, I remember where I was on that day, and we'll never forget it. I'm sure that's the same for everybody, and we will never forget all those affected, especially the family and friends of all those who died. Can I join the Prime Minister in, in his comments about Faelan as well, and also about football, and wish... The very best of luck to the England football team this evening. I'm sure the whole country, with the possible exception of the Conservative MP for Ashfield, will be watching this evening and cheering England on. <laughs> Mr Speaker, can I also extend a special welcome to the new member for Batley and Spen? And will members opposite forgive me if I just turn round um, to look at the new member for Batley and Spen as she sits there on these benches beneath the plaque to Jo Cox, her sister. And that's a special and emotional moment for all of us on these benches. And I, I think for everybody across this house, it takes incredible courage and bravery uh, to stand um, in that constituency um, and to sit on these benches beneath that plaque. Mr Speaker, we all want our economy to open and to get back to normal. The question is whether we do it in a controlled way or a chaotic way. Yeah. The Health Secretary told the House yesterday 
that under the government's plan, infections could go as high as 100,000 a day. Now, a number of key questions fall from that. First, if infections reach that level, 100,000 per day, what does the Prime Minister expect the number of hospitalisations, deaths, and the number of people with long COVID will be in that eventuality? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, the, uh, there are a number of uh, projections uh, and they're, they're available from the, from the SPI-M graphs, but it's certainly true, Mr Speaker, that we are seeing a wave of, of cases because of the, the Delta variant, but uh, scientists are also absolutely clear uh, that we have severed the link uh, between uh, infection and serious disease and death. And, and currently there are only uh, a thirtieth of, of, the, of the deaths that we were seeing at an equivalent position in previous waves of this uh, pandemic. And that has been made possible thanks to the vaccine rollout, uh, the fastest of any European country. And I think what uh, people would like to hear from uh, the party opposite, because I wasn't quite clear from that opening question, is whether or not they support the progress that this country is intending to make on July the 19th or not, Mr Speaker. Uh, he says it's a reckless to go ahead. Does that mean he's opposing it? Starmer. Mr Speaker, we know that the link between infection rates and deaths has been weakened, but it hasn't been broken. And the Prime Minister must, and he certainly should know the answer to the question that I asked him. That he won't answer it here in the House hardly inspires confidence in his plan. Mr Speaker, let's be clear why infection rates are so clear, are so high. Because the Prime Minister let the Delta, or we can call it the Johnson variant, into the country. And let's be clear, let's be clear why the number of cases will surge so quickly. Because he is taking all protections off in one go. That is reckless. The SAGE papers yesterday, Mr Speaker, make clear that with high infection rates, there's a greater chance of new variants emerging, greater pressure on the NHS, more people will get long COVID, and test and trace will be less effective. Yeah. Knowing all that, is the Prime Minister really comfortable with a plan that means 100,000 people catching this virus yeah. every day and everything that that entails? Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I really think that we need to hear uh, from what the Honourable uh, what he actually uh, supports. Uh, we will continue with a balanced and, and reasonable approach. And uh, I've given the, the reasons uh, this country has rolled out the fastest vaccination programme uh, anywhere in Europe. The, the vaccines provide uh, more than 90% uh, protection against hospitalisation, both of them. Uh, Mr Speaker, by the 19th of July, uh, we will have vaccinated uh, every adult will have been offered uh, one vaccination. Uh, everybody over 40, Mr Speaker, will have been offered uh, two uh, vaccinations. That is an extraordinary achievement. That's allowing us to go ahead. Now, last week, uh, Mr Speaker, or earlier this week, uh, he seemed to support opening up. Uh, getting rid of the one metre rule. He seemed to support uh, getting back into nightclubs and, uh, uh, and getting back into pubs without masks, Mr Speaker. Uh, but if he doesn't support it, perhaps he could clear it up now. Is it reckless or not, Mr Speaker? Mr Speaker, we should, we should open up in a controlled way. Keep, keeping, ba keeping base licence protections such as masks on public transport, improving ventilation, making sure the track and trace system remains effective and ensuring proper payments for self-isolation. The Prime Minister can't just wish away the practical problems that 100,000 infections a day are going to cause. can't wish them away. The next obvious one is the huge number of people who will be asked to isolate. If there are 100,000 infections a day, that means hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people, are going to be pinged to isolate. The Financial Times estimates this morning that that could be around 2 million people per week. The Mail says 3.5 million people a week. Either way, it's a massive number. It means huge disruption to families and businesses just as the summer holidays begin. So we know what the FT thinks. We know what the Mail thinks, what their estimates are. Can the Prime Minister tell us how many people does he expect will be asked to isolate if infection rates continue to rise at this rate? Mr Speaker, I want to thank everybody who uh, self-isolates. Uh, they're doing the right thing. They're a vital part of, 
uh, this country's protection against, uh, against the disease. And what we will be doing is moving away from self-isolation uh, towards uh, testing in, in the course of the next uh, few weeks. And that is the prudent approach, because we all have, Mr Speaker, vaccinated even more people. But what he, uh, what he can't explain, well, he can't have it both ways. He says it's reckless, it's reckless to open up, Mr Speaker, and yet he attacks, yet he attacks self-isolation, Mr Speaker, which is one of the key protections uh, that this country has. And let me ask him again. Uh, he, uh, on Monday, Monday, he seemed to say he was in favour. He seemed to say he was in favour of opening up on July the 19th. Now he's saying it's reckless. Which is it, Mr. Speaker? Maybe I can help a little, just to remind us that it's Prime Minister's questions. If we want, if we want opposition questions, we'll need to change standing up. The question was simply how many people are going to be asked to self-isolate if there's 100,000 infections a day, and he won't answer it. And we know why he won't answer it and pretends I'm asking a different question. He ignored the problems in schools. Now the 700,000 children off per week because he ignored it. Now he's ignoring the next big problem that's heading down the track and going to affect millions of people who have to self-isolate. Now it won't feel like Freedom Day to those who have to isolate when they're having to cancel their holidays, when they can't go to the pub or even to their kids' sports day. And it won't feel like Freedom Day, Prime Minister, to the businesses who are already warning of carnage because of the loss of staff and customers. It must be obvious, with case rates that high, his plan risks undermining the track and trace system that he spent billions and billions of pounds on. Prime Minister, there are already too many stories of people deleting the NHS app. He must have seen those stories. And they're doing it because they can see what is coming down the track. Now, of course, we don't support that, Mr Speaker. But under his plan, it's entirely predictable. What is the Prime Minister going to do to stop people deleting the NHS track because they can see precisely what he can't see, which is millions of them are going to be pinged this summer to self-isolate? Mr Speaker, I, 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 of course we're going to continue with the... Uh, program of, uh, of self-isolation for as long as that is necessary. I thank all those who are, uh, who are doing it. Uh, but, of course, what we're also doing is moving to a system of testing rather than self-isolation. And we can do that. We can do that because of the massive rollout of the vaccine program. And, and what I'm still not... And I think about the fourth or fifth time, Mr Speaker, it's still not clear whether he's actually in favour of this country moving forward to step four on the basis of the massive rollout of vaccine. And yes, it, of course, Mr Speaker, uh, it, this is unlike the law, where you can, you can attack from lots of different positions at once. To oppose, you must have a credible and clear alternative. And I simply do not hear that. Is he, is he in favour of us moving forward, yes or no? It's completely impossible to tell. Uh, just to, once again, it's Prime Minister's questions and the Prime Minister answers questions. Keir Starmer. If he stopped mumbling and listened, he'd have heard the answer the first time. We want to open... We want to open... We want to open in a controlled way and keep in line baseline protections that can keep down infections, like mandatory face masks on, face masks on public transport. Now, we know that that will protect people, reduce the speed of the virus and the spread of the virus, and it won't harm the economy. It's common sense. Why can't the Prime Minister see that? Prime Minister. I, of course, Mr Speaker, we can see that it's common sense uh, for people in confined spaces uh, to wear a face mask out of respect and courtesy uh, to others, but such as on the, on the tube. But what we're doing, Mr Speaker, is, is cautiously, prudently uh, moving to, from a legal diktat, from legal diktat to allowing people to take personal responsibility uh, for their actions. And that is, the, that is the right way forward, Mr Speaker. And I, I must say that uh, if really that is the only difference between us, if he supports absolutely everything else, uh, so opening pubs, opening nightclubs, uh, getting rid of the, uh, the one-metre rule, uh, getting people back to work, and it all, it's all about whether the difference between uh, making face masks mandatory or advisory on the tube. If that is the only difference between us, Mr Speaker, then that is good news. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to hear him clarify that. 
Mr Speaker, he agrees it's, public, it's, it, it, it's common sense because it protects the public, but he mo won't make it mandatory. It's ridiculous. It's clear what this is all about. He's lost a health secretary. He's lost a by-election, and he's getting flack from his own MPs. So he's doing what he always does, crashing over to the other side of the aisle, chasing headlines and coming up, up with a plan that hasn't been thought through. We all want restrictions lifted, we want our economy open, and we want to get back to normal. But we've been here too many times before. Isn't it the case that, once again, instead of a careful, controlled approach, yeah. we're heading for a summer of chaos and confusion? Yeah. Minister. Uh, no, Mr Speaker, is the answer to that. Uh, and uh, these are, of course, these are, these are difficult decisions. They need to be taken in a, in a balanced way, and that's what we're doing. And uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, to do all these things, uh, frankly, Mr Speaker, it takes a great deal of drive and it takes a great deal of leadership to get things done. And if we'd, if we'd followed his advice, Mr Speaker, if we'd followed his advice, we would still be in the European Medicines Agency and we would never, well, it's absolutely, we would never have rolled out uh, the vaccines as fast as, if we'd followed his advice, Mr Speaker, we would never have got schools open again with all the damage uh, to kids. Uh, education, and frankly, Mr. Speaker, if we listened to him, if we listened to him, we would not now be proceeding cautiously, pragmatically, sensibly to reopen our society and our economy and give people back the chance to enjoy the freedoms they love. We're getting on with taking the tough decisions to take this country forward, Mr. Speaker. We vaccinate, they vaccinate, we, we, we inoculate, Mr. Speaker, while they're invertebrate. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week I visited Penketh South Primary School in Warrington to talk to Year 6 children about how we can generate cleaner energy in the future. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that as well as backing electric vehicle production in the North West, there's a great opportunity to shift towards low carbon hydrogen by providing support for projects such as Hynet Northwest, which by 2030 will secure thousands of green jobs in the Northwest, as well as by cutting emissions to the same level as taking four million cars off the roads. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, I, I believe that the North West, in addition to uh, the rest of this country, can uh, be a world leader, will be a world leader in hydrogen technology, and I think the HiNet project is an excellent example. Uh, we've already put uh, 45 million into supporting uh, the HiNet project, kick-starting kick our hydrogen capture and uh, storage, and I thank him uh, for his support. We now come to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I wish England all the best for the yeah. match tonight against uh, Denmark? And, and I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister on the tragedy of the bombing of 7 7 that we all remember so vividly. And also, Mr. Speaker, yesterday was the 33rd anniversary of the Piper Alpha disaster, yeah. where 167 people cruelly lost their lives. And our thoughts are very much with the friends and family that are still grieving over the terrors of, uh, of that event. And, and, and finally, before I move on, this is also Srebrenica Memorial Week, and we should be remembering those that have suffered at genocide, whether that be in Bosnia, in the Holocaust, in Rwanda, and many other places. And perhaps the Prime Minister will meet with me to discuss how we can help the, the Srebrenica uh, charity here in the UK. Mr Speaker, this week the Tory government introduced its so-called Electoral Integrity Bill. In the reality, the bill is designed to do anything but increase the integrity of our elections. It is a solution in desperate search of a problem that simply does not exist. What the bill will do is to impose for the first time Trumpian voter ID laws in the UK. The Electoral Reform Society says it could lead to voter disenfranchisement on an industrial scale. Disenfranchising people from working class communities, BME communities and others already marginalised in society, creating barriers to vote. Prime Minister, why is this Tory government trying to rob people of their democratic right to vote? Mr Speaker, what we're trying to protect is the democratic right of uh, people to uh, have a one person, one vote uh, system. And uh, I'm afraid that I have personal experience. I remember vividly uh, what used to go on in uh, Tower Hamlets 
uh, and I think it is important that we move to uh, some sort of uh, some sort of voter uh, ID, and uh, plenty of other uh, countries have it. Uh, and it, it, I think it's eminently sensible, and people, I think, will be reassured that their votes matter. Uh, and that's what this bill is about. I, for goodness gracious, Prime Minister, come on. There were 34 allegations of impersonation in 2019. This is a problem that does not exist. It is a British Prime Minister seeking to make it harder to vote because it's easier to get re-elected if the government can choose their voters rather than letting the voters choose their government. Mr Speaker, three and a half million people in the United Kingdom do not have a form of photo ID. Eleven million people do not have a passport or driver's licence. These millions of people will be directly impacted by seeing the right to vote curtailed. Yeah, yeah. And it's not just the opposition saying this. Members of the Prime Minister's own party have called his plans an illogical and illiberal solution to a non-existent problem. Mr Speaker, will the Prime Minister withdraw these vote-rigging proposals immediately or he will continue down the path of being a tin-pot dictator? <laughs> Right. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, look, I think he's making a bit of a mountain out of a mole, if I may, if I may respectfully uh, suggest. Uh, councils will be under an obligation to provide free photo ID to anybody uh, who wants it, and I do think it reasonable uh, to protect the public uh, in our elections uh, from the idea of voter fraud. Nobody wants to see it. No, and by the way, I don't think that elections in this country uh, should be in any way clouded or contaminated by the suspicion of voter fraud, and that's what we're trying to prevent. Murray. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I was pleased to see my right honourable friend in Cornwall for a very successful G7 summit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whilst I know he didn't manage to get South East Cornwall, I can assure him that Loo is a very beautiful coastal town. The problem is Loo floods regularly. Will my right honourable friend speak to government departments to get this sorted? Uh, I, can I, uh, through my honourable friend, just uh, uh, thank again the people of, of, of Cornwall, South East Cornwall, everybody. We had, it was a, a wonderful hospitality that the G7 had, uh, and I assure her that I, I'm aware of the problem uh, of the flooding uh, in Loo, and uh, uh, I can tell her that uh, uh, my right honourable friend, the Environment Secretary, uh, has met Cornwall Council to discuss the matter, and we will do everything we can to sort it out. You'll have me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to add my uh, voice on behalf of the Albert Party to the comments about 7-7. On the morning of 7-7, I was in a meeting at UCLH A&E as the um, information started coming through, and I would pay tribute to every single one of those uh, frontline staff that I worked alongside on that day. It was a long shift, and it was a long walk home that evening. Um, the Prime Minister talks about vaccines. Accurate surveillance is really important as well. It's equally as important. And on the 15th of March, the Department of Health and Social Care Minister, Lord Bethel, on Twitter said that Omega Diagnostics and Wologic were in line for 2 million lateral flow device uh, order per day by the end of May. Uh, it promised jobs and security. So can the Prime Minister explain why his government uh, is undermining the superior domestic diagnostics tests while propping up um, discredited Chinese imports to the tune of £3 billion. Pounds. I thank the uh, Honourable Member. I don't think that's an entirely uh, fair characterisation of what the government is, is doing. Uh, on, on the contrary, we have worked night and day to build up our domestic lateral flow uh, capacity and, and continue uh, to do so. Tim Law. Mr. Speaker, last week President Xi cheerily threatened that any foreigners attempting to influence China will have their heads bashed against the Great Wall of Steel. And of course, he's still in denial about human rights violations and the genocides in Zhejiang and Tibet, as recognised by this House, and as a result of which five of us remain sanctioned. So, will the Prime Minister therefore support our motion to be debated in this House next Thursday? calling for a diplomatic boycott of the 2022 Winter Olympics, incredibly awarded to Beijing, until and unless this dangerous regime abides by basic international standards of decency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, Minister. 
I thank my honourable friend, but this country has uh, led the world in condemning human rights abuses in, in Xinjiang, in putting sanctions on those uh, responsible, uh, in, uh, in holding companies to account uh, that, in, that, uh, that import uh, goods made with forced labour in, in Xinjiang. And I will certainly consider the, uh, the proposal uh, debated, but I must say that I am uh, instinctively and always have been against sporting boycotts, Mr. Mr. And the Chamber. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister and others on the anniversaries being marked today. Now, this Sunday, 11th July, marks two years since the Government committed to reforming a cruel aspect of the welfare system, which forces terminally ill people to prove that they have six months or less to live before yes. they are granted yes. fast access to benefits. In the Motor Neuron Disease Association, Marie Curie estimate in that time 7,000 people have died waiting for a decision on their benefits claim. And with the pandemic and the NHS managing that and the backlog of diseases, this situation will only become more acute. When will the government publish its review and finally scrap the six-month rule as it has committed to do so? Yeah. I'm great. Uh, thank you, the, the Honourable Lady. I, I'm uh, aware of the issue that uh, she's raised. To the best of my knowledge, we are making that change, but I will, I will write to her uh, as soon as I have that information. David Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, whilst the extension of the grace period for the uh, supply of chilled meat from Great Britain to Northern Ireland is welcome, uh, Lord Frost is entirely right to say that it amounts in truth to no more than a temporary sticking plaster. So can my right honourable friend please confirm that unless the European Union adopts a more proportionate approach yeah, yeah. to the application of the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, this country will do whatever it is necessary, legislative or otherwise, to fix the problem permanently? My right honourable friend is uh, uh, sadly completely right in his analysis. There remain uh, very serious problems in the, uh, what I believe is the misapplication, the excessively uh, legally purist application of that, of that deal uh, and of that protocol. And what we are hoping for uh, is some progress uh, from the European uh, Commission, uh, some, uh, some repairs that I think that they should make to the way this is, uh, that this is working. Uh, but uh, to echo what he has said, uh, we certainly rule uh, nothing out in our approach. Angela Crawley. Prime Minister, one in four pregnancies end in miscarriage. And therefore, does the Prime Minister agree that parents' grief for this profound loss is not an illness? Therefore, parents should receive formal miscarriage leave rather than resort to sick pay or unpaid leave if their pregnancy miscarriage occurs before 24 weeks. Will the Prime Minister support my private member <coughs> bill and introduce paid miscarriage leave for parents? Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I sympathise deeply with anybody who has uh, suffered the, the, the loss of a, of a baby uh, by, uh, by miscarriage, of course. And, um, uh, what I can tell her is that uh, we, are, uh, we did in, uh, introduce in 2020 paid uh, parental bereavement leave, uh, but uh, what we, uh, that, enti that entitles uh, those who lose a child uh, of, of, after 24 weeks of, of pregnancy uh, to, uh, to, to, to some uh, payment. But uh, of course, nothing I can say and uh, no payment uh, we could make would be any consolation uh, to those who experience uh, a miscarriage in that way. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Serious Fraud Office achieved a rare success in Southwark Crown, Southwark Crown Court in April with, with a successful prosecution of GPT special projects, which uh, resulted in £28 million of penalties for corruption. The key whistleblower in this case was my constituent, Ian Foxley, without whom the prosecution would never have happened. Yet he's been totally hung out to dry by the Serious Fraud Office, despite 10 years of financial devastation. Does my rational friend agree that unless we properly compensate whistleblowers, they simply will not come forward? And would he consider making a payment out of the £28 million received from, by the HM, HM Treasury to compensate him for his losses? Um, well, I, th I thank him for his excellent question. I want to thank Mr Foxley. Uh, for his whistleblowing, because he has seen uh, justice done. The trouble is we don't normally uh, compensate whistleblowers in the, in the way that he, uh, he recommends, but I know that my right honourable friend, the Solicitor General, has offered to, to meet uh, my honourable friend to discuss the matter further. Bell 
Thank you, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Yeah. On Monday, we celebrated the 73rd birthday of the NHS, one of the very best things about our country. Yeah. Now, many of yeah. us on this side of the House and our constituents remain committed to protect the fundamental right of universal health care free at the point of delivery. But this government remains a constant threat to our public health service. No staff pay rise, a 25% cut in the number of mental health beds, and the widespread sell-off of GP practices like the Edith Cavell surgery in my constituency to American private insurance giant Centene. And also, just to mention, the health and care bill, which will only open the doors for privatisation wider. Why is the Prime Minister continuing to evacuate our most essential public services? And why won't he listen to the thousands of essential workers who demonstrated on Saturday to end NHS privatisation, end chronic underfunding and understaffing, and keep the NHS public? Mr. Speaker, I don't think I, 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 with great respect to the, to the, to the lady opposite, member opposite, I don't think I've ever heard uh, a, a, a question that was more uh, in, inversely related to the, to the to reality. Uh, this is a government. This is a government uh, that, from, that from, the, the, from the beginning, invested the biggest amount uh, in the NHS for, for a generation. Then, in the last year, we put another £92 billion, pounds, Mr. Speaker, into, into frontline care. Uh, we've increased uh, nurses' pay uh, by 12, starting pay by 12.8% over the last three years. And above all, Mr Speaker, we're not only building 48 more hospitals, uh, but there are another 59,000 people working in the NHS this year than there were this time last year. This is a government that is putting our NHS first. Sculptor Kate Rithis. Kate. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm sure the whole House welcomes the fantastic news of Nissan's investment in an electric battery gigafactory in Sunderland. But does the Prime Minister agree with me that batteries are only part of the solution in pursuit of net zero by 2050 and that zero carbon hydrogen combustion engines, such as those recently developed by Midlands based JCB, have an important role to play in our country's decarbonisation plans? Minister. Uh my, my honourable friend is completely right because the, the investments that we're seeing just uh, in the last uh, week or so, the Sunderland investment by Nissan, the, 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 the gigafactory uh, in Sunderland, the, what Stellantis uh, are doing at Ellesmere Port, these are tremendously exciting for battery powered uh, vehicles. It's fantastic. But we must not forget hydrogen, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. As I, as I said uh, in an earlier answer, we want uh, this country uh, to be a world leader in hydrogen technology as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know the Prime Minister is aware of the fatal and serious accidents that taken, road accidents that have taken place on St. Albans Road and Redbourne Road in my constituency. Could the Prime Minister advise the House and advise me on what more the government is doing to improve road safety, not just in the case of fatal accidents, but often where there are serious accidents or near misses, because this is an issue that's of growing concern to many of my constituents and I believe to many across the country. I, I thank my honourable friend that he's, uh, he's right to, to raise this, although the, uh, those who have been killed or seriously injured uh, in, uh, on the roads has been coming down over a long uh, period of time. It is vital uh, that we invest in this. We put another £100 million uh, through the Safer Roads Fund uh, to invest in 50 of the most dangerous uh, stretches on, uh, on A roads. And I also draw his attention to the Think uh, campaign, which can play a huge role in reducing deaths and serious injuries on our, on our roads. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To their bitter disappointment, and despite the assurances given during the Fire Safety Bill that it would do so, the Building Safety Bill published on Monday does little to help the hundreds of thousands of leaseholders who right now face financial ruin as a result of the building safety crisis. My question to the Prime Minister is a simple one. Why is his government seemingly intent on failing to honour the commitments given to those leaseholders and members of this House by refusing to legislate to fully protect all the blameless victims of this scandal. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. But that's not uh, accurate, Mr Speaker. We are, con we are continuing uh, to uh, support uh, all uh, those who have to remediate uh, their buildings. And I just remind you, the five billion that we've provided uh, is five times, Mr Speaker, what Labour offered to support uh, in, their last, uh, in their last manifesto, and we will make sure that all the leaseholders, uh, people who have suffered uh, from the consequences of the Grenfell uh, conflagration, uh, do get the advice and the support they need. Right. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend will recognise the huge service done by independent hospices to those at the end of their lives, to their families, 
and to the NHS because these people would likely otherwise be in hospital. He will also understand the huge impact that the COVID pandemic has had on the fundraising capacity of these hospice charities. So can I ask him to consider carefully and personally the case that is being made by independent hospices for greater government support for their clinical costs, costs which if they were no longer there would undoubtedly be borne by the taxpayer and by the hard-pressed NHS. I, I, I thank my right honourable friend, because, and he's totally uh, right to draw attention to the incredible uh, selfless work of, of hospices up and down the country, charitable hospices. Uh, they, they do receive uh, £350 million pounds of government funding annually. He's right to draw attention to the particular difficulties they've had uh, in fundraising, and that's uh, this year over the, over the pandemic, and that's why they've received an additional uh, £257 million pounds, uh, in national uh, grant funding arrangements. Let's go to Imran Hussain. Imran. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in January, the Prime Minister promised me that he would listen to the calls of those that the government had excluded from vital support to protect their jobs, businesses and incomes during the coronavirus pandemic. Yet over the last six months, many of my constituents are still coming to tell me that they have been shut off and ignored and millions across the country continue to be excluded. So I have to ask the Prime Minister, why did he give those who have been excluded false hope instead of the support they desperately needed? Minister. Mr Speaker, I, I thank the Honourable Gentleman. Of course I know how tough it has been for millions of people up and down uh, the country. I know how tough it has been uh, for business. But that's why uh, this Government put in an extraordinary £407 billion to support jobs and livelihoods across the country throughout the pandemic. And the single most important thing we can do now uh, for, the, for the individuals, for the, the families that he represents and, I, I, and that he's rightly uh, talking about today is to help our country to get back on its feet uh, by cautiously opening up in the way that we are on, on July the 19th. Uh, uh, if uh, we can uh, take that step, which I very much hope that we will, and I hope that it may command the support, uh, if not of the Leader of the Opposition, uh, then at least of him. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The River Test is one of the finest chalk streams in the world, but since May, diesel has been spilling into the river. What matters most is that the flow is stopped and that there is an effective clean-up, but there are many agencies involved which has made a coordinated response challenging. Please will my right honourable friend make sure the Environment Agency, Natural England, Southern Water, local authorities and DEFRA are all involved to solve this environmental catastrophe together. I, I, I thank my right honourable friend, she's completely right. Uh, all those uh, bodies are involved, but the lead agency is the Environment Agency. Uh, I know that they're in, uh, in touch with her and I, I must say I have a very high regard uh, for them and for their work. Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure the Prime Minister actually uh, welcomed uh, the new member, the Honourable Member for Bat and Spare, but perhaps he'd want to correct the record afterwards. Yeah. Uh, they say where there's a will, there's a way, and, and the public will clearly welcome uh, the government's move to introduce uh, emergency legislation uh, for pubs and bars uh, yeah. tomorrow to be able to stay open uh, on Sundays later. However, the public will wonder why tomorrow that the member for Delin. Uh, will be allowed to return to this uh, house yeah. and not subject to a recall, yeah. uh, despite be, being the case of a serious case of sexual harassment. And actually, the public doesn't understand why there should be one rule for Conservative MPs yeah. and another for the rest of us. So, therefore, will, therefore, will the Prime Minister, will the Prime Minister allow time tomorrow for a motion to close this loophole yeah. and make him subject? of a recall. Yeah. Uh, I, I, first of all, I, Mr Speaker, uh, the, the gentleman in question, has uh, the sanction has come to an end. And secondly, uh, he is in error. The gentleman opposite is in error. He is not a Conservative MP. David Davis. Mr Speaker, this year thousands of children will die because of the government's dramatic cuts in international aid. Top lawyers in the country advise us that this policy is unlawful and it's never been presented to this House for approval. When he was previously asked by my right honourable friend for Sutton Coalfield, he suggested that the estimates vote would be the appropriate vote, but that does not allow us to increase the amount of spending on this aid. So I ask the Prime Minister again, when are we going to get a binding vote 
on the government's aid policy. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to my right honourable friend, but I'm assured by uh, my, uh, my right honourable friend, the leader of the House, that, uh, that the uh, House was given a chance to vote on this matter on the estimates, base, but, but mysteriously uh, chose not to. Comrade Singh Dashi. Thank you so much. Mr. Speaker, my grandmother, whom I love dearly, was lying on a hospital deathbed, and none of us were allowed to be there to comfort her in her final moments. I couldn't even carry her coffin on my shoulders. I also had to endure the agony of watching alone online the funeral of my uncle, my fun-loving uncle, and we were not there to comfort my brother-in-law's father, who had somehow contracted COVID in a Slough care home, during his final moments, all this because we followed government guidance. Yep. Having yep. experienced such painful yep. personal sacrifices, like many others, yep. imagine our collective disgust when in order to curry favour with the Prime Minister's chief advisor, we see psychophantic, spineless, hypocritical government ministers lining up to defend the indefensible, saying it's time to move on, with some even having the gall to tell us that they too go for a long drive when they need to get their eyesight tested. What an absolute disgrace, and they shall be thoroughly ashamed of themselves. So when is the Prime Minister finally going to apologise to the nation for not mustering up some courage and integrity for doing the honourable thing and sacking his chief advisor, who so shamelessly flouted his own government guidance so that he could have regained that lost public trust and confidence, and he could have demonstrated that it's not one rule for him and his elite chums, and another for the rest of us plebs. Well said. It is very emotional, and Prime Minister. Perhaps the best thing I can say, Mr. Speaker, is how deeply I think uh, I, the government, everybody uh, sympathises with those who have uh, gone through the suffering uh, described by the gentleman opposite. And uh, no one can, uh, who hasn't been through something like that can imagine uh, what it must feel like to be deprived of the ability uh, to mourn uh, properly, to hold the hands of a loved one uh, uh, in their last moments in the way that uh, the Honourable Gentleman describes. And I know how much sympathy there will be uh, with him. Uh, and uh, I, I take his, uh, his criticisms uh, most sincerely uh, of the government uh, and everything uh, that we have done, but all I can say we have tried uh, throughout this pandemic to minimise human suffering, uh, to minimise loss of life, and uh, for where we have, and for, as I've said before, when, when he asks for me to apologise, uh, I do. I apologise uh, for the suffering that the people of this country have endured. Uh, and uh, uh, all I can say is that nothing and, uh, I can say or do uh, can uh, take back uh, the, the lost lives, uh, the lost time spent with loved ones that he describes. And I'm deeply, deeply sorry for that. Point of order, Sammy Wilson. Speaker, on the 23rd of June, my colleague for Lagan Valley asked the Prime Minister whether Article 6 of the Act of Union 1800 had been impliedly repealed when the uh, protocol was approved, by, the Northern Ireland Protocol was approved by the House of Commons. The Prime Minister answered emphatically no. Last Thursday in the High Court, responding to a case made by the Government's lawyers that the Northern Ireland Protocol was not in conflict with the Act of Union because Article 6, which guaranteed equal trade across the United Kingdom, had been impliedly repealed when the Withdrawal Act was passed through the House of Commons, Mr Justice Colton agreed that Indeed, Article 6 of the Act of Union had been overridden by the passing of the Withdrawal Acts here in the House of Commons. Now, here's the point, um, Mr. Speaker. The government's case was approved, presented, and argued before the Prime Minister gave the answer to my colleague in the House of Commons. And that answer, therefore, must have been a misleading answer to the House. And I want to know whether the Prime Minister can be called to apologise for that misleading answer, but more importantly, called to outline what action to undermine the damage or suggest inadvertently. Inadvertently misled the House 
And so I, I would like to know, can the Prime Minister be called to apologise for inadvertently misleading the House and uh, secondly, outline what steps he intends to take to undo the damage which the change in the Act of Union has caused constitutionally and economically to Northern Ireland? Yeah, yeah. 